up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. It's right down there and it's free. That enables us to keep coming to y'all as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate your support in getting us this far. Now, today, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by somebody I've known a long time. This is long overdue. Mr. Nasty Ness, thanks for coming through, man. Hey, what's up, Soren? How you doing? Man, it's good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while, but I'm glad we were able to make this happen. Well, you know, it's, it's a pleasure, man. And uh, just to see you come up, because I remember you when no one knew what a Soren was. And now now everybody knows what a Soren is, man. I'm so proud of you, man. So what's up? What's up? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But uh, Nasty Ness has so much history in the game that we got to get to and, you know, still putting in work now. So we got to go through a lot of this stuff so people get a better, deeper appreciation as to your contributions to the game. So uh, one thing uh, I wanted to go taking it all the way back is um, moving from the Philippines to Seattle uh, when you were around 10. Do you remember why your parents chose Seattle of all the places to move? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, we lived on the army base in Okinawa and our hometown was the Philippines. And my mom was a nurse in a military base, and uh, she had a job, got a job offering to work in the States at a hospital, you know. So the stereotype of all Filipino women are nurses, it's really true. <laughs> so my mom got a job in Seattle at uh, Providence Hospital as a, as a nurse. She became a registered nurse, and she also wanted to see uh, 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 my sister and I you know, uh, have a brighter future. Uh, coincidentally, my sister had a scholarship to New York University, which is how I got involved in hip hop because I had a visitor every year in New York. And that's how I got to meet uh, DJs from 92 WKTU in the very early days. But it was just my mom. My mom, you know, a single mom. Um, man, she took uh, my sister and I were just young and uh, she picked CL because there was a job offering there. And Man, you know, I'd never been in the States before, and I was, like, really amazed to, to see houses, freeways, and it was a whole new life for me, man. And uh, I hated it at first because all the shows I used to watch on Okinawa and the Philippines and the TV, it didn't work in Seattle. I didn't, I didn't understand. I go, hey, man, I'm putting it on Channel 31, and it's not on there. What's, what's up? You know, but uh, I'm really glad, uh, blessed and, and, and glad and so thankful that my mom – did what she did. And uh, I moved to Seattle in uh, 1970, 1970. Wow, man, that's crazy. And then mm -hmm. with uh, your sister was when was she, when did you start going to New York? Uh, we moved in 1970, um, probably around 1971. It, you know, because um, uh, being a tight Filipino family, my mom uh, always wanted us to stay close. Uh, relationship you know and believe it or not I, was, I went on an airplane all by myself at 11 years old to New York but you know I looked older for my age and you know, I used to use a mascara and, and make my mustache dark like it is now this is all mascara <laughs> and I used to look older than my age and then when I was in New York I go man I don't like it here until I discovered 42nd Street Times Square and I became a man <laughs> I was back gonna say days. back then it was a little different than it is. Oh now. yeah, it was fun back then. At, at, at being my age, boy, my testosterone was running on high. <laughs> I can only imagine. Now, also with uh, Bruce Lee, you were involved in one of his institutes early on. How, how, and why did that end up happening? Well, uh, when we moved to Seattle, uh, we shopped at a grocery store called Thriftway. And the manager of that store is a gentleman by the name of Taki Kimura, who ended up becoming like my second father, father figure in my Sifu in martial arts. Uh, not knowing his ties to Bruce Lee, um, you know, he, uh, he taught, you know, Bruce Lee's Jun Fan Gung Fu Jikundo downstairs in the basement of the grocery store. But I didn't know, you know, until the day Bruce Lee died. And I looked in the newspaper and his picture was in there. I go, mom, there's your friend, Taki Kimura. He knows Bruce Lee. Oh, I kept begging her, you know, to uh, introduce me to him so I can learn Kung Fu. 
But before all that happened, she would always confide in him because, you know, I was one of those kids that didn't listen. So she would always go to him for advice. And um, so he figured out, you know what? I know how to shape up your son. And uh, he asked me to come one Monday night to, to class. And uh, he said, I'll shape up your son. And, uh, and that, that, that night when I started my first class there, I was 13 years old. And uh, that's, that's how it all started with him, you know, and uh, being a part of the original Bruce Lee School. But prior to that, I was also taking Hong Gar Kung Fu at a different location. And the only reason why I did that is because at that time, during that year, uh, the TV series Kung Fu starring David Carradine was really popular. And, uh, you know, I said, oh, man, I want to learn how to do this and move in slow motion and beat people up. But everything I learned in there didn't teach me any of that. You know, I was like, man, I want to learn how to beat up people. Man. It's not working. <laughs> but uh, I really learned not just martial arts from my Sifu Taki Kumara, who passed away a year ago. Not, I didn't learn just martial arts from him, but I learned to be a man, to be respectful, to help others, to be humble. Man, he, he really changed my life, Soren, because I was kind of a bad kid, you know, didn't listen to anyone and you know, very stubborn, you know, very arrogant, I, I guess. Hmm. Kind of like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. But where did this, uh, where do you think this stubbornness and arrogance came from? I think, uh, you know, being raised by a single mom, uh, not having a full-time dad and um, just having memories of every time when he would come and visit, uh, I always remember hearing them fighting, yelling, the abuse, being picked on by uh, other kids when I first moved to the States because, you know, I was really overweight. And I used to wear these Hawaiian shirts thinking I was looking really cool at 10 years old with these Hawaiian shirts because they were really cool back in Okinawa and in Hawaii, but not in Seattle. And I would just get made fun of a lot. I, you know, I was my nickname and was uh, Uncle Fester Fatso. Uh, Watabu, which means fat in Japanese, Taba, which is fat in, in Filipino. I was the brunt of all fat jokes. And man, it really takes a toll on you, man. And uh, yeah, then all of a sudden you just get so angry and you just want to <laughs> lash out. Kind of like you. <laughs> now, now you're losing me. What do you mean? <laughs> I just played. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that's why, you know, uh, the uh, verbal abuse. And sometimes physical abuse, you know, I should get picked on a lot. Hmm. Okay. And then how would you say learning and studying this as it helped you and as you grew as a teenager and then as an adult, what did you learn about yourself and why you think rap and hip hop cultures gravitated so much to martial arts as well? Well, I, I, I got to tell you what changed my whole life is when I uh, used to hit on my, my, my ex-wife, hit on girls, and I used to hit them, you know, because I, I, the crowd I grew around with growing up, uh, you know, were people in gangs, uh, pimp, uh, around a lot of prostitutes who are my friends, you know, and just to see their lifestyle, um, you know, I guess domestic violence, I grew up like that. And, and because of that, I got arrested and I had to go to anger management. And I tell you, uh, anger management, and I really wanted to control my temper because I would break things and, you know, hurt people when I was angry and, and taking that really humbled me out. And plus my, my Taki, Sifu Taki Kimura, always talking to me, telling me stories because Bruce Lee was hot headed too. And I kind of wanted to be like Bruce Lee, you know, hot-headed also, but he get, just kept telling me, you know, don't take that same path, you know. Um, he just, he humbled me out a lot. And and losing my mom at such a young age, she had cancer and died when I was only 18 years old. Um, that really uh, made me uh, grow up really fast. And uh, I, I dedicated her last year. And I told my mom, go, mom, I know the last year, last wish, you want to see me graduate from high school, man. And I studied so hard. I'm getting really emotional here because I studied so hard because I hated school, man. 
and I graduated. I, I graduated with like a 2.5, but when I graduated, you know, and she was there seeing me, you know, get my high school diploma. So I was able to do that for her. And, and I made a promise to her that I would do my best because she really suffered and worked hard to give us a good life in the States. And I wanted to repay, repay her by, you know, doing something with my life, but she never got to see what happened to me, you know, hmm. like you. <laughs> well, congratulations though, man. Cause it's, um, it's a lot to deal with, um, yeah. you know, with your, your parent, your mom dying and, and dealing with the bullies and all kinds of other stuff. It's a lot, a lot to deal with. And I know, you know, I'm a father as well. And I know too, I always appreciated and still do everything my parents have done for me, but having a child, it's a deeper level of appreciation that you can only get when you are a parent, I think. So how many kids do you have? One. I have a daughter. She's 12. Shout wow. out. Shout out, Lauren. Look at you. Big papa. Well, so then so then you know how it is. <laughs> yes. But with that being said, how, when, and why did you get into DJing? Oh, that 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 story is a wonderful story. You know, like I said, I, I always had to visit my sister every year in New York. And this is the early days. And there was a station called 92 WKTU. Uh, man, it was the best station. It had, uh, uh, what's the guy that discovered Madonna? Uh, Jellybean Benitez was a DJ there. The Latin Rascals, the on-air DJs, Paco, Al Bandero, Carlos De Jesus. I got to meet all of them because my sister's best friend was working there. Her name is, she's still on the air on WBLS, Ann Tripp. And uh, she had to drop something off for Ann Tripp at the station. So when I went there while they were hanging out, you know, Ann said, hey, why don't you take a tour of uh, the station? So one of the guys took me around and I got to meet everyone. And I go, wow, this is so cool, you know. And I was maybe 15 years old, maybe. And uh, I said, man, I want to I want to do this for a living, you know, uh, play music you like and get a paycheck. And uh, and man, I probably could meet a lot of single women. <laughs> this would be a dream job. Well, that's how it all started. And, and it was the early days when hip hop was just about to uh, make its noise. And um, so that, that you know, the, the DJ part was listening to like the Latin Rascals DJ on the radio, uh, their master mix that they did. And I, I always wondered, man, how do they do that live? But they weren't doing it live. And then I realized, oh, you know, it's like multi-track and, you know, but it sounded so good. And I wanted to imitate exactly what they were doing. So when I got my first job in radio in 1980 on a commercial station, I pretty much took the elements where I heard in New York and I did it in Seattle. I go, man, I hope this works. I hope people like it. And man, my ratings were so high, sky high. I was like, hey, and people thought I created it. But really, it was because of my influence from New York. That, that's why 92KTU and uh, Mr. Magic at uh, WBLS and uh, Frankie Crocker. Um, man, man he, he had the voice that I, I always wanted to sound like him, you know, so I would try to pretend I was him when I was on the air. <laughs> now, is this at uh, K Fox? Yeah, 1250 K Fox was the first radio station that I got a job on. Prior to that, I was at W Community College, KCBS uh, College Radio for almost a year. And I had to play jazz music. And I don't know anything about jazz music except only jazz I knew back then was Bob James, Chuck Mangione, and Ramsey Lewis, and John Clemmer. But they had me playing just other stuff like Mingus. Uh, some deep hardcore jazz but they said this is the best way to learn to be on the air is to get on the mic make a mistake make your mistakes and that's how you learn and, and that's how i learned you know and then i learned uh, how to dj and all that on the wheels from um, ed Locke, who uh, actually started uh finance nasty mix records he was a dj growing up and uh, i used to get my hair cut at his house the sister used to cut my hair because it was cheaper doing it at the mom's house and every time i went in there i'd hear all these good music upstairs like lakeside fantastic boys confunction and i said who's that and then she goes oh that's my brother uh, you might have heard of him on uh kyc radio and he dj's at a club called spectrum 
I go, wow, he sounds good. I want to, I want to do that too. <laughs> so uh, he would take me along to all his uh, appearances and gigs. And that's how I learned how to uh, DJ on turntables, but to get it behind the mic and talk to a crowd because I used to be so scared to get in front of a camera or in front of a mic, you know, where I'd have to probably drink like one, five, one rum. And, and then I wouldn't be scared anymore, but that's how I learned was, was doing that. And I was maybe 17, 16, 17 years old. I want you to listen real close to me. I'm going to ask you some real simple questions, and I want some real simple answers. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you understand? Yes, I, I understand. You said that you couldn't have possibly been at the crime scene at 11.15 because you went to the bookstore my, my audio book and my hardcover book at 11.15 when the crime scene occurred in Soren's book. The history of gangster rap. So you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying the books. Right, right. At 11.15, I was, I was at the bookstore at, at 11.15 and when, when I, bought, I bought the books and accidentally left them at the store. So at 11.15, you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying books, right? At, at 11, 15, I was, we, we was, when I was leaving, it was, it was some people coming in, and I, I, I forgot to grab But you, you, you don't remember who what they look people, like. What would they look like or nothing, right? No. Hmm. So. Twelve fifteen. You went to the bookstore buying my audio book and hardcover book and Soren's book at twelve fifteen. So you couldn't have been at the scene because you were buying the books, right? Yeah, at twelve exactly at twelve at twelve fifteen exactly. I was at the bookstore. <laughs> You know you're not fucked up. Which, which no, one? First you said you were at the bookstore at 11.15, and then you said you was 12.15. You know you're not fucked up, man. He fucked up. Yeah, he fucked up. He fucked up. Man, you, you confusing me, man. So, you get my book, my audio book, 40 years in Soren's book, History of Gangster Rap, and if you don't, you know you're not fucked up, right? Man, the more those cops ask me questions, the more I wish I bought them motherfucking books. <laughs> 